Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Hi, good everyone. It's uh, Phil Tarrant here. I am the host of the Smart Property Investment Show. Thanks for joining us today. It's uh, smack bang in the middle of summer. Uh, most of you, I hope, are listening to me sitting on a beach somewhere in some far-flung glamorous location or just uh, uh, somewhere near uh, home or close to family just enjoying some time outside of the office and uh, reflecting on what you're going to do next year when it comes to property investment and how you choose to create wealth. Um, there's a lot of ways that uh, as a journalist uh, we get to these sort of parts of the year and uh, we do a lot of reflecting about you know what happened, what's going to happen, top stories, this and the other. And if you've been tuning in over the last couple of weeks, you would have uh, listened to quite a lot of that sort of stuff about the things that made the headlines in smartpropertyinvestment.com.au over 2017. Um, but I want to do some crystal balling today, and uh, crystal balling is good fun. Um, you're never right or wrong, but it's nice to think about what might happen. And uh, Australia's property markets are a very fluid beast. Um, obviously, markets within markets, markets change all the time. Uh, the fortunes of Australia's property investors fluctuate in line with the needs and demands of our government and uh, global economies and macro and microeconomic factors. I'm not going to bore you with all the reasons why markets change, but I'm going to try and give some insights into it, some perceptions on what's layers ahead, some observations about challenges. And I'm not going to do it myself because I'm not qualified, but I have someone in the studio that is. And that's Charles Tarby. He's the chairman of Century 21 Australasia. Charles, how are you going? Oh, I'm going pretty well. Big introduction. It is, mate. <laughs> Big introduction. Set you up to fail. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have. <laughs> and you've uh, got me a nice coffee, so I'm all ready to go. Well, so the last time, go. last time you were on the show was... Um, about 18 months ago, uh, back in June 2016. We had a good chat, and um, then we did a couple of podcasts by memory where we spoke about the market, but we also spoke about your journey through property. So go and uh, uh, tune in. Uh, really enjoyed it. They were very popular. Um, I think it was about the 16th of June 2016. Uh, go and enjoy. But um, I today, got a lot, Charles, of, uh, lot of uh, close and extended family went on and liked it for me. So that's if you've what got you some need. good response, that's what happened. That's <laughs> Whatever fine. it takes. Well, it's all part of the marketing strategy. <laughs> it is, it is, it is. And uh, something that... Uh, Century 21 agents do really well. That's uh, one of the reasons why they're some of the best agents in the country. But I want to get inside your brain today, mate. Sure. And um, yeah. uh, before we look at 2018, let's go back to, to this year. Mm. And, uh, you're a very vocal commentator on uh, Australia's property market, particularly residential sales, um, but also from a property management perspective. So you're well qualified to be able to talk about what happens in Australian property and you have franchise outlets right across the nation. So I know you're connected in with um, small suburban markets and also the sort of macro stuff in terms of state-based fluctuations, this and the other. So here we are, um, a year's past, 20, yeah. 2017. Um, what you're thinking at the start of the year versus where your headspace is at the end of the year, much difference? Yeah, I, I don't think so. Actually, mm. it just took a little bit longer than we expected. Okay. Uh, we expected a change in the marketplace. Uh, that change is now upon us. In uh, it, it certainly arrived early in places uh, uh, that are associated with mining and so on, uh, whether it be uh, uh, parts of Queensland, Northern Territory, Darwin in particular, uh, pretty, had a pretty tough time, same as Perth. Uh, but those other marketplaces continued to ride just a little bit longer. Sydney started to slow down, but Melbourne continued to move forward. And it was fairly obvious why Melbourne was moving forward. And Melbourne and Canberra were two areas that we predicted very strongly would grow, uh, but mainly because so they, they had a good steady supply. Canberra's got suburbs. They just keep opening when they need to. And uh, the Victorian government were very proactive when it came to uh, property release, land release. And when you look at the pricing in Melbourne compared to the pricing in Sydney it made Melbourne very, very attractive. So the clearance rates started to overtake Sydney uh, during the middle of the year and continued to. Uh, most of the time, the, the clearance rates in Melbourne were, were the best. And not only were they were the, they were the best, but they were over a significant number of auctions. It's only just in the last week that we've had a decline in the uh, vacancy, I'm sorry, in the uh, clearance rates in Melbourne coming in at 67.3% last week with 1,628 auctions when Sydney had 690 auctions and a clearance rate of 60.8. So you can see that those two uh, capital cities are quite significantly uh, distance apart when it comes to uh, actually getting those numbers on a weekend and really seeing what's going on because if you're doing it over three times, as almost three times as many auctions in Melbourne, you're really getting a very very strong indication. Mm. So that market started to come back. We we expect that the the Melbourne market will settle down now. Uh, Sydney has certainly uh, settled down, 
and uh, it settled down to a nice place because it dropped into 58% uh, percent clearance rates a couple of weeks ago and jumped back up. So it's back into that settling down period, ready for next year, ready for steady movement of pricing. Uh, there'll be some some locations that'll come back in price because they jumped way too high. Mm. Uh, and, and I think you'll see what might appear to be negative growth, but it's not really. It's just an adjustment. Mm. Uh, and we see what we... We've always said it before. I think I've said it to you before, Phil. There are only two types of markets that we're ever in, and, and that's one where we get a buyer up to meet what they think is a vendor's ridiculously high price, and that's called a boom. And the other where we get the vendor down to meet what uh, the vendor thinks is a purchaser's ridiculously low offer, and that's called real estate. And that's what we're in 90% of the time. Mm. And I think we're coming back into real estate. And that's okay. Mm. Great place to be. Okay. Great place w- to be. What about... Um Queensland. So you spoke about uh, the city Melbourne market. Yeah, look, the Queensland market. I people, there's an ad appeared on uh, a major radio station that said that said that I predicted Queensland mm. is going to uh, boom. That's where you should buy. Well, I've never said any such thing at all. In fact, the Sunshine Coast is where I picked as an area that would move very strongly, and and um, I've been vindicated mm. in uh, in both uh, in Melbourne, Canberra, and the Sunshine Coast. They've all moved very strongly. I've always been concerned about the Queensland market because there has been a significant oversupply coming in in apartment sales. And if you look at Queensland in the mainstream, when you get a lot of investors go running up there because the prices are good, you're invariably going to get a reversal of, of rent fortunes. And, and then you're going to have a situation where vacancy rates are high. Mm. Uh, and so that's always a big concern to me. And now when looking at, at the Brisbane market, um, in terms of, of pricing in the last uh, five years, the apartment prices have only increased 0.9%, whereas the residential housing prices have increased over 25 mm. But in the same time, Sydney had an increase of 75 plus. So uh, those marketplaces, I think, um, when it got a little bit ahead of themselves when the Sydney... Uh, when the New South Wales market was slapped with the exit tax on the car government and it stopped the prices uh, of Sydney moving and Brisbane got a little bit too high. Uh, I think Brisbane has got great opportunity, but I think it's a very steady opportunity. I don't see any reason to rush in buying and I certainly don't see any reason to get in there and, and think now's the time to buy uh, an apartment off the plan, et cetera, because there are thousands, literally thousands and thousands of apartments that are due to settle mm. off the plan in the next 12 to 24 months. And there, are, I believe, will be a significant number of people who won't be in a position to complete. Mm for two reasons. Uh, one, the overseas money isn't there. And, uh, and and if you bought something off the plan two years ago and you put down 10% and you're from China, uh, you probably don't care about that 10% and it's going to be hard to find you in China. And the other reason is that uh, the bank valuations, uh, banks traditionally in tough markets call for valuations before settlement. Mm. And I'm not sure that some of those apartments will meet the bank's expectation and people will either have to cash up put more cash up front mm. um, or they'll have to pull out yeah and so i think that that's looming in parts of brisbane and i agree with you and that dynamic for our listeners who aren't really familiar with what we're talking about it's when if you buy an off the plan apartment or you commit to the purchase you put down a deposit and it might take two mm. years for yeah. the build so you're hoping that um the, the fancy glossy brochures that you've uh, looked at and the slick salespeople have told you it will value up at $400,000 and therefore you commit to that price. But really, the bank only deems it to be worth three hundred, three fifty. dollars So it's under what you expected. Yeah. But you're committed to still buy. And you've got a lot of developers now offering incentives. Now, they're not offering you any, any reduction in price. They can't. If they offer a reduction in price, it's going to devalue the entire complex. So they might offer you some sort of incentive. And uh, excuse me for talking so much. Uh, I've been known to talk a glass side of sleep, Phil. Around these subjects. And I'm, I'm, you know, it's not a doom, a doom uh, day prediction. It's just be careful. You know, the real estate market in Australia is good, strong. It's a strong economy. Interest rates are going to stay low for a while. Just be careful what you do. Yeah, be responsible. Hmm. So we might as well go around the grounds then. We've, we've covered the Eastern Seaboard. I'd be remiss of us to uh, forget about Tasmania, which for many people is a, a vibrant uh, market for investors. What's your take? I always uh, advise people when they want to buy in regional um, areas or areas like discretionary spending or Tasmania or Hobart, mm. you wait until Melbourne uh, starts to boom a little. And, uh, and you give it 12 months and then you buy in Hobart because invariably people will get some growth in, in uh, their asset 
and then they look for an investment. Hobart's a great city, uh, and uh, the, it's, it's the building costs are not going to be much different, but the price of the block of land is going to be significantly different. And so all of a sudden, the investment in Hobart looks great, and they start to rise because people have gained equity in other locations and are able to use it. And that's what's happened. I think that equity position is is now already being used. I'm starting to see vacancy rates. I'm sorry, I'm starting to see rent price movement in the negative in Hobart in the last three to four weeks. Um, and uh, just in this last week, the rent week over week went down 1.29%. So that means that there's probably more investors in there. That means that there's more competition in there for those investors. And it basically means that uh, when you have competition, you're going to have to either reduce the rents or offer incentives to tenants. And if people aren't prepared for a, a vacancy on, on a rental property, they can get themselves in a bit of trouble. Yeah, well observed. And uh, how about uh, South Australia? What's your thoughts? I love uh, South Australia only because it's it's had a constant steady flow of property uh, coming into the marketplace. It's had a lot of negative news at the same time. Mm. So you get a balance. You've got this balance of there's uh, an excitement in real estate market, but gee, can we get a job? So it's been one of those those states where the movement in price has been steady all the way through. Uh, in the, the last week, sorry, the last few weeks, the Adelaide clearance rates have been pretty strong compared to this time last year. There's only three capital cities at the moment, and that's Brisbane, uh, uh, Perth and Adelaide, that have had a better clearance rate in the last few weeks than this time last year. All other capital cities have gone significantly backwards. So I think that that's a steady marketplace that you can invest in fairly comfortably. You just have to make sure you allow for a little bit of extra cash just in case you do get a vacancy or if there's a, a closure of another industry because uh, South Australia seems to get belted with that. It does. Uh, but there is, a, there is upside there because of um, mining and so on now that's kicking in in a steady way. Mm. So it's not going to be a big boom town, but it's going to be a good, safe... Very good, steady area yeah. to buy in, okay. yeah. And speaking of boom and bust, uh, WA? Oh, yes, the lovely WA. So there are people who bought property pre-boom uh, five, six years ago and saw a lot of capital growth. And today, the price of those properties is the same as what they bought them for. So they've gone through an incredible cycle, a full cycle. Uh, and and uh, Perth is one of my picks over the next uh, few years to okay. get some good growth because it's it, it's gotten so low that there are people here with negative equity. There are people here with mortgages that are bigger than the value of the house. Uh, so the market has taken a significant hit. And uh, the property management portfolio that I hold over there is it's, um, substantial enough for me to get stats mm. from. And uh, it's in the many, many thousands of properties that we manage. Uh, and the vacancy rates there have been in the 10s and 11s for most of the year. And it's just been the last three to four months they've started to drop. Okay. And they've been coming in under eight. And, and I haven't seen a six yet, but I've seen a seven. Last week was 8.49% vacancy rate. Okay. So that's pretty good for Perth. And I noticed a slight increase in rents of plus uh, 96.96% increase in rents over this time last week. So there I'm starting to see a change. And if I was an investor, and I, I would look at Perth very strongly because of South Africa, United Arab Emirates, they um, they buy in those areas. Mm. Uh, they put a lot of their money there from their own sometimes uh, unsafe economies and uh, in addition to that there's an extended mining boom starting to occur in Perth in, a, in an organised manner again, mm. not where people go crazy. So I think if you're going to buy, you're going to buy in Perth, remembering that the median price of a property in Perth was almost out of Sydney's a, a few years ago, yeah. well below now. It's so so uh, there's a, they're the sort of places I'd be looking at. It's got to be a lot more livable and always has been livable town, Perth. Um, uh, historically, but now mm. Qantas is going to fly direct to London from there. Yeah, you know, it's going right. to open up, open up Perth to the world even better. But um, and we we don't often talk about it. I cop a bit of flack sometimes. Um, these smaller markets like Tassie and Darwin, mm. uh, Northern Territory. Any any views on yeah on Darwin? The, top end? the biggest problem with Darwin is that it it is probably more of an Asian city than it is an Australian city nowadays. Mm. So it seems to be connected to Asia more so. Um, and you don't hear much about Darwin uh, in the news, or and you really sometimes don't even know if it's part of the country, the, the, with the distance and uh, and so on. But that economy is probably the one that struggle the most. If you look at the pain and gain reports that CoreLogic put out, it's had a significant amount of pain in terms of people selling uh, properties for a lot less than what they purchased them for. Yeah. So uh, when you, ca you come into Sydney as an example and you'll see that in the September quarter, 96 plus percent of people who sold in that quarter made a profit. Uh, you go to Darwin, 34.5% uh, just over made a loss. Yeah. 
in their property when they sold it. It so, worries me that, you know, mm. I, I hear that sort of stuff and I just go, okay, it's the rationale for doing something like the Smart Property Investment Show, hopefully get people to make better property investment decisions, you know, it's like... People do rush into them. I yeah. see people that, that, uh, that I've known for a long time and they know to, to, to have a chat. It's not as though every decision I've made has been right either. But, mm. the, but the point is that, that uh, nowadays I've got my hands on data and, uh, significantly over the last five, six years, weekly data that I keep and you can see patterns now. Mm. And the thing, the most important thing is that uh, some of these people who you think are pretty switched on to it have gone and bought property in mining towns because the rental returns are high. And I said, well, why did you do that? You know, that, what happens if the mine closes? Oh, no, we're in a boom, sure, sure enough. Gone. Uh, gone, and who wants to buy them? Yeah. You know? There's a lot of people still bleeding from uh, mining booms in Port Headland and uh, up that way. You know, it's, uh, you know, sometimes it keeps me awake at night just how bad sometimes people go. You know, it's, uh, it's alarming. Um, you've got agents right across the country. Before we sort of start crystal balling into uh, 2018, Agents right across the country, large franchise network, um, uh, some very um, uh, experienced agents, some 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 newer guys to the marketplace. Yeah. But I like to look at markets and sentiments within markets from um, just the the attitudes or the sentiments of of real estate agents. Um, mm. So when you look at your network and you've got some some great performers out there, but which agents, which state, which which capitals yeah. have the, the most spring to the step right now? Yeah, well, I, I think it's an interesting thing too. Culture in an organisation is important mm. and, and, you know, like-minded people are, are attracted to, to each other. And, and so I, I try to set up an organisation that's very down-to-earth, very family-orientated, very uh, mum and dad, if you like, uh, family operations, so that they've got a purpose for being there, not about how fantastic they might be, the the cars they drive, the holidays they take, the gloss, the shine, the whole thing. And, and so um, we've managed to, to build an organisation with some very strong families. And I'll give you an example, if I go to West Pennant Hills, uh, the the people that own that operation there, Joseph Tan Real Estate, uh, th- their children are involved, and now their children's children are coming on stage with the parents to receive awards, and so you've got a, a, a strength in terms of a family that that understands the business from from uh, grandfather down to grandchild, and from my perspective, those are the sorts of people that can help other families buy and sell real estate uh, and so from from my point of view it, it's that sort of focus in getting those types of people and and families and it's not just in different parts of the country they they're all over the country uh, the the Melbourne agents have always seen themselves as a better quality of agent and I have to say that when you look at some of their marketing strategies and their presentation skills and so on they seem to be far more advanced uh, than than most so you, you'll find a good quality of, of presentation from agents in those areas but across the Australia and New Zealand for me it's about the uh, the strength of the unit of the family unit that gets involved in the business and the bigger I see that happening the more I see that happening the more I know that people who buy and sell through us are going to be treated in the same manner as a family and when you look at agents is that uh, a good advertisement for my company then? yeah there you go Let yeah you I just one, want, mate, you want to make sure <laughs> seeing it's a free ad I thought I might throw it in <laughs> there you go no I'm um, you know I, I talk to a lot of real estate agents, both professionally and as mm. a property investor. So I see all walks of life, and uh, um, some agents just always miserable. You know, they've got their heads <laughs> in their hands. Uh, doomsday merchant, sky's falling in. There's not yeah, enough to be Yeah, mental. They, yeah. they, they sort of people are brighten up a room when they yeah, leave. Absolutely, I know who you mean. <laughs> absolutely. And uh, then you have other agents who, irris- irrespective of the market conditions, they're still killing it. You know, and so, and, that, and, I, and I actually see that in in my organisation uh, almost. From one suburb to the next, mm. you'll see one person is going, "Wow, I'm just so busy," and the other person saying, "What's going wrong?" Mm. And it, it does come down to the the individual and the attitude of those individuals. Look, I go on a Qantas flight um, along, and I fly Qantas all the time, and I've only ever had one bad experience with them. And I wrote to Qantas about it, and I still fly with Qantas. But that one person, Qantas, the brand got me there. Qantas, the brand kept me there. Their loyalty programs and so on. But that one person who treated me indifferently on a flight could have made me decide never to go to Qantas again. And sometimes you get that in an organisation, you'll get a person that is just not, something's not right that day, and they'll present themselves a certain way, and all of a sudden my organisation is on the nose with everybody in in that region because uh, of that one person. So it's it's incredible to watch the attitudes of different people. 
uh, and uh, those that get up and recognise that problems are a sign of life and the more problems you have, sometimes the more you're living. Uh, and, and I think that they acknowledge that, take it on, rather than uh, walk past you and go, oh, God, not again, not another day. Uh, and, and I've seen that so often. It's tough when I step away from property investment per, per se for a second into business because mm. um, uh, it's interesting. How, how, do you, how do you police that? You know, and, and you know, I've, I've watched Century 21 over numerous years and very occasionally you'll have um, an agent that would behave inappropriately, mm. whether it's to do with trust funds. And it's not just Century 21. It's all real estate franchises oh, have yeah. struggled well, every now and every, then. How, how yeah, do you, how every do you company has, has their yeah. battles with that. Yeah. Uh, look, again, it comes back to the culture of the business. Mm. And, uh, and, and as I mentioned to you before, you try to bring in certain people that are like-minded. Yeah. And when I look across my organisation, I really do see a very large family. Mm. And and I think that's the part I like most about it. When, when we do have conferences and conventions, a lot of the suppliers who will provide uh, services and products to other organisations will always make the same comment. Mm. It just feels different with you guys. And, and I think it's just that. There's no um, – nobody puts anybody on a pedestal. Yes, we reward our top people. But, you know, if they, if they start to think, well, they're more important than the than overall concept, they get they get cut down pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, I'd, look, I'd, I don't get a chance. Uh, you know, I own the business. But um, – uh, you, I, I'm not going to go rolling up and, and expect to, them to be different towards me because, mm. you know, we're all in the same business. We're all Absolutely. trying to look after our families and, and other families and, and move forward. And I think we keep that approach to it pretty good. Mm. Yeah. And you always impress me, Charles, because whenever I speak to you, you've got more information inside your brain that you can pick. And, and by the way, um, for our listeners, uh, uh, Charles has sort of um, rattled out uh, auction clearance rates across the nation this week and uh, vacancy rates, etc. Testament, he hasn't got anything in front of him. So th- this stuff's up inside his brain. I've seen on Sky and stuff, same thing. You just, you know yeah. the numbers. And as an investor, I always talk about it. You need to know the numbers, right? You need to know yeah. the numbers. You need to know your portfolio. But, um, you know, you're a, you're a walking Google of real estate. So, um, That's you know, kind of you. Thank hence you. the reason why I'm, I'm happy to go, what's going to happen next year? So yeah. I know you know the numbers. You, you look at trends, you identify mm-hmm. trends, and you use those trends to shape the way in which agents will work, give them the information they need to be better real estate agents, whether they're servicing the vendor or, or, yes. or they're looking to sell. Um, what's going to happen? What's going to happen next year? It's going to be think, a good year in real estate. Yeah, and, and, and uh, it's going to be a great year in real estate for those that know what they're doing. Uh, and that's that's the biggest issue. We've had uh, four or five years now of, of a real estate cycle where it looks really easy. Mm. You know, you, you put up an auction banner and uh, people come along and they buy it and the agent uh, talks about how much over the reserve they got and and everybody's looking at the uh, shiny videos and the and the shiny cars and the suits and the, the way in which people dress overall, male or female, and the way in we're presenting the industry and it, and and people are going, I, I'm I'm in. I want to. I've never seen more auctioneers come into the industry and have in the last mm. you know four or five years. I'd like to see what they're going to look like. Uh, next year. So it's easy uh, to be an auctioneer the last couple of years. Oh, man, I, I, I've been an auctioneer for years and, and conducted thousands of auctions, and I've spent that much time working uh, with buyers and sellers in an auction room, you know, for up 30 minutes to, to an hour sometimes to get something to happen. Mm. Uh, and that's what I was talking about before. That's called real estate. Yeah. Uh, not this, you know, you, the, the whole glossy image of real estate. Real estate's not what you see on, on social media. I mean, people, uh, hardworking people, spend most of their nights seeing people after hours because that's the only time you can see them. And they, they're there working with people who are the, at home with their families while you're not mm. at home with your family. Uh, and it's... and uh, the, the way in which you see real estate occur in the real world is that we will list a significant number of properties, but you may not sell half of those properties. So you, you will spend time with a whole lot of people and not get paid a single cent mm. for all of that work. It's one of the very few industries. I know I, you can't go to a, a ring up a doctor and say, I'm just going to tell you what I think is wrong with me. I want your opinion over the phone before I come in and pay you. It doesn't work that way. But in our industry... Everybody wants to know what's going on. They want you to come out and see their property. They want you to work with them, provide them with reports, et cetera, et cetera, for absolutely nothing. Mm. And when the market is a slower market, which we're coming into, that's when the real real, real, real estate agent comes to the, to the surface. Mm. And I, I've said it so many times, when perception meets reality, reality comes off second best. And what people have been seeing about uh, the real estate industry in the last few years is not what our industry is about. Yeah. It's full of very, very hardworking people who don't get paid for a lot of the things they do. 
And we're very pro real estate agent. Mm. Um, uh, however, there is a reasonable amount of disruption in this space right now with um, yep. uh, low cost, yeah, you've got based, yeah. Um, let's, let's talk about you know, it. purple let's, bricks. Let's you've got chat. yeah. You've so, got, so, yeah. A little chat. so we'll get we'll get onto predictions for twenty yeah, and six. That's because so, yeah. this, this is intriguing because um, uh, a lot of people think. Uh, yeah, I'll sell my place. My so you got four sub. I own a website. Mm, so mm. You got your purple bricks, which is low low cost um, uh, listing engine. Um, I think a lot of people don't really understand and appreciate the role of a real estate agent to the vendor to achieve the best price possible. They think that can be um, democratized, and you take the person out of it, and it should happen mm. itself. Which in a hot market might be the the, the truth, but in yeah. a slower or slowing market. You need game. somebody to work for you. And yeah. say so in, in a good market, lots of disruption comes up mm. because it looks easy, as I was saying. So you get your purple bricks or and, or, or you get uh, open agent who are um, promoting themselves as finding you the best agent. But, but um, in, And a lot of vendors don't know they're paying open agent or the agent's paying open agent, for example. But I don't see them as disruptions. Uh, I, one of my good friends, uh, Graham Marabito, ex-CEO of CoreLogic, said, hey, you're looking at it the wrong way. Uh, and uh, it's called constructive evolution. That's not disruption. That sounds like something he was saying. Yeah, and, I, and, <laughs> and I, I looked at it and I said, he's right. Open agent are doing a certain job that mm. obviously we as agents are not doing very well. Uh, if Purple Bricks are able to achieve a great result for a seller with a lower commission, great, we need to learn. Mm. Uh, and so my, my advice to anybody is never about the commission, it's about the agent. And if you find the right agent and they can do it for a cheaper price for you and they're going to do the best job, Go with them, mm. uh, but don't go with an agent because it's saving commission. That's absolutely the wrong thing to do. Uh, so I, I know what it's like to negotiate a transaction, and I know that, that if if you incentivize a real estate practitioner to do a job for you, and then their incentive is their commission, and they're getting paid well to do that job, then they're going to do the best possible job for you because it's not just about you. They want y- your family and your friends as well. And but if you if you go into a low cost agent because it's low cost commission, and they stick up a sign and they charge you up front and they put a couple of ads on realestate.com, great. If that's if if you think that that's getting you the best possible price, then you're probably going to be a, a very injured person sometime down the track. And let's be fair, when you're selling a property, if you're a vendor, the key goal is to get as much as possible you can do it. You, you don't, you're not going to sell it for as cheap as possible. You don't get too many chances no. if you've only got one property. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had a, remember the story of a gardener who worked for me and at my recent now retired and and uh, he, he uh, I, I was scouring one of the websites and I saw his house on, on, on a private for sale. So I went out to the garden. I was at home. And I said, Dave, um, what are you doing? He goes, oh, you know, we're going to save agent's commission. I said, I mean, we've known each other for 30 years. I said, so, uh, and I see your house for sale on a private for sale. So he said, we've already sold it. And I said, uh, how much? And he told me. I said, have you signed contracts yet? He said, I think we have. I said, well, you better ring your lawyer and, and make sure that if you have, because if you haven't, you need to withdraw. You've sold it for 100000 less than what it's worth. Mm. But he was saving agents' commission. And it was right in front of me. And I there thought, you wow, you know, it doesn't hurt to get agents out and get some advice. Mm. Um, just don't make your decision based on cheap. Make your decision based on what the agent can do for you and, and, and challenge the agent. You know, each week, come and see me. There's only two reasons why a property doesn't sell. Either the vendor's price is too or the marketing is poor. And if the, the vendor and the agent agree on the marketing and then each week they, they go over that marketing and make sure it's on track, it's the price. Mm. But if the marketing is not right, adjust the marketing. But don't do it any other way because you're going to save commission. You are not going to save commission. Well, the thing is that as a property investor, I always look for those properties which haven't been marketed very well. Yeah. Because you pick them up cheap? Um, I can't say that, but you can. <laughs> well, can uh, yeah. There are certain places if you're going to buy a property you go to, and, and it's generally not uh, um, It's generally not in areas you might think, yeah. yeah. Well, poorly, poorly, <laughs> poorly marketed properties are... Uh, Gold mine oh, yeah. for, for property investors, but uh, some so of the make, agents. So if you're a seller, make sure you get a good agent to market it well. I think my too. good friend Tom Panos showed me an ad that said uh, an auction it was, and it said uh, diseased estate yeah. uh, was the heading. So it wasn't deceased; it was diseased. And, and so you you see some of those, and you wonder whether the the agent you're dealing with is on their game. Mm. Uh, He's um uh, I caught up with Tom the other day, and uh, always enjoy having a chat with him, and. Uh, that guy, that guy hustles hard auctioning, doesn't he? Like he every does. every single Saturday, he works here you know, for. Uh, we've had Tom on the show before him, but for our listeners that don't know Tom Panos, um, uh, he probably does 
eight eight or so auctions every Saturday. Yeah, he he's works very the busy Newtown, man. Um, the sort of Newtown in a, in a, in a, West, in a, in a West yeah, type yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. And he's a great, great source of knowledge about the market and what's going mm-hmm. on. But um, we'll, we'll get him on the show uh, again soon. You can tune in. But I remember, Charles, um, sort of crystal boiling into uh, 2018. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I've been to a couple of functions over the years when. When you mentioned Graham Mar- Maravita, who's yes. the ex- CEO of CoreLogic, RP Data. Um, you guys used to have a bit of a punt on... We did. What, what, what did you guys used to bet on? Uh, we it was used to bet on, on the, on the uh, movement of property prices. Across uh, each state? Across each state. Uh, yeah. You still do it? And, and No, we didn't, yeah. I think. I'm not sure which one of us was injured the last time because it was a big bill you had to pay Yeah. to take 20-odd people out to lunch. That's it. Uh, I know the first year uh, I won... And uh, hands down, and mm. and I remember all of a sudden Graham's a senior analyst, and I'll name him, Mr. Tim Lawless, who's mm. a good friend, but I'll yeah. name him. Somehow came up with a report that that uh, had me right line ball and losing, and I said, no, no this is not wrong. But uh, Graham conceded that maybe he should at least pay for half the bill. But, Fair uh, enough. We stopped doing that. Uh, I think we just got busy yeah. more than anything else. It's but a bit unfair, if, also. The guy owned a. Property data. Well, they have a pro- give yeah, whatever it was, yeah, you know, yeah. But look, their property data is. I, I get. I see a sale happening in real time. Yeah. Right now, because every office in across Australasia is connected to a CRM platform that that uh, I developed over the years, and so I can see exactly what's happening yeah. in each location as they get a listing, as they make a sale, etc., and what price. So, uh, so I was always saying to him that yeah, you get you get uh, real time data, but most of their data back then was also uh, delayed data, mm. Mm. and so. So uh, this is why this is how he used it on me. I said, "Hey, this is real time today, Graham. These are my stats." And uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to bag him. A bit, he's a bit elastic mate. data sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but anyway, look. So so let, let's let's create a new tradition, Charles. So at the end of every year, let's, yes. let's get you back okay. in the studio and and let's let's set out what you think. I think uh, 2018 yep. is going to happen across each of the okay. states in terms of growth. You happy to do that? Yes, I am. Um, yep. And then. Uh, We'll reflect again in a year's time. See how right. close Sounds good. Sounds nice. good. Nice. All right. Well, let's start. New South Wales. Uh, New South Wales, I believe, will will head backwards uh, in the, for the early part of next year. Yep. Just adjusting, and then I believe we'll have steady growth right through the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And uh, it won't be major growth, but I believe, subject to interest rates as always, and which yep. we don't have a lot of control over in this country, uh, I think uh, people who bought property in uh, in New South Wales will find the end of next year that they'll have had some modest capital growth. Okay. Cool. Victoria. Uh, again, I think Victoria uh, is still more left in it than uh, uh, New South Wales because I think their pricing is, is excellent. Uh, and I think that also the uh, lifestyle is excellent. Mm. So if you compare Sydney and Melbourne, I think the big difference between the two obviously is a wonderful harbour. Uh, but uh, I think it's a very sophisticated lifestyle in Melbourne. And, and I think that they'll probably have better growth than Sydney. Okay. Uh, QLD. Queensland's going to be an interesting one, mainly because I think it'll be dragged back a little bit uh, with too much investment in there and uh, also dragged back a little bit with an oversupply of apartments. So I see housing as still having uh, reasonable growth, but I see apartment um, uh, pricing as, as coming back a little bit. Cool. Uh, Tassie, we spoke about it. I think that's going to balance out. I don't think we'll see much out of Tasmania at all because I think it's had its growth and I think it's now just going to go back into a steady cycle of being there, waiting for the next Melbourne cycle to occur. Fair enough. Uh, SA? I like SA and um, I don't think we'll see massive growth, but I think we'll see steady growth in in SA because um, it's economically, I think it's getting better and I, there's a, a significant number of suburbs that are still ready to be released in SA. The SA government's very proactive. One of our officers deals with most of the land sales for the government and uh, they're working very hard to get sales through, which indicates to me that the market's stabilised okay. somewhat. Uh, Northern Territory? Northern Territory still think has um, some negative patches to go through. Yep. Uh, and I think if it ends up at the end of next year slightly ahead, uh, it will be a real bonus. Okay, and, and WA, and it's yeah. a tough one because we're talking Perth yeah. primarily. Um, Perth. Yeah, I see Perth as, as having a, um, a bounce back yeah. from its uh, dark days and, uh, and some modest growth out of WA for sure. Okay, so... 
we're not looking at any huge boom anywhere, really. No, and I don't think we're looking for any crash either. I don't yeah. think the bubble's going to burst anytime soon. Uh, again, the problem is interest rates. Mm. If interest rates, a lot of people haven't quite worked it out. If you're if you're paying an interest rate of four percent somewhere, and uh, it, it that's nice and comfortable. But if you are on ten percent and you've adjusted your st- your standard of living at ten percent, and it goes up to twelve percent, you, you're going to be able to cope with that because it's a you know a modest increase but it goes from four to six and that's the same movement in interest rates that's a 41 percent increase in your repayments yeah and that's what a lot of people don't haven't figured out yet mm. so they're gonna be really careful uh, about watching the interest rate movement very closely yeah that's a good point um so in terms of price growth, steady as she goes, keep mm. an eye on interest rates to make sure you I can. don't think, I, sh- I keep stops. Got to stop mentioning Harry Dent. Harry's, uh, I've never met Harry. He's, yeah. I'm sure he's a lovely guy. Uh, but uh, he's he's t- called a bubble in Australia pretty much every year for the last six, seven years. Mm. We haven't seen it. Uh, unless there's a, a, a collapse globally, uh, I don't see it. Um, but if, you know, uh, I think Harry will be right one of these days. Mm. Not, not next year. Not next year. I don't think so, no. So it's just about ensuring that your exposure is reasonable that uh yeah keep, should that happen what do you do keep about your it? lvrs lower mm. uh do some debt reduction yeah while you can uh don't fix your interest rates on your entire property fix it on part mm. so you've got some movement where you can get some debt reduction because if you come out the other side uh, at a fixed rate of four percent you come out the other side in three years and the interest rates are seven percent you're in big trouble yeah you're gonna hurt nice one i thought we did that pretty well charles yeah thank you that's no, it's good um as, as, as usual, mate, thanks for your support this year. It's, Great. Um, All the best it's always for the good festive season. And commentating on uh, and Smart Property Investment, let's let's do more of it next year as well. So, good man. Thank cool. you, Phil. Nice one. Remember to check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au if you're not yet subscribing to our morning market intelligence, so you're the first to know about what's going on in property, even more than what's inside Charles' head most days. Uh, we can get to market possibly before him, uh, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au forward slash subscribe. If you'd like to get your information from uh, social media, uh, just search Smart Property HQ. You'll track us down. And that's it for us. Uh, until next time, um, we'll see you then. Bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.